So um, welcome to the Tech Policy Lab's um, Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, for those of you who do not know, um, the Tech Policy Lab is an interdisciplinary unit here on campus. Um, we formally bridge uh, the School of Computer Science and Engineering, the Information School, and the Law School. Um, but within our community, we have uh, folks that are faculty and students from many other departments, including electrical engineering, um, nat uh, natural language processing, uh, urban studies, um, communications, and others. Um, and we are devoted uh, to putting together inter interdisciplinary teams um, to help policymakers broadly understood make more wise and inclusive tech policy. Um, you know, my name is Ryan Kahlo, and along with uh, Batia Friedman and Tadayoshi Kono, we are the three co-directors um, of the lab, um, and uh, we're very excited to, to welcome you. Um, up to two times a year, we, have, we bring in someone really special into the community in order to deliver our distinguished lecture. And so today I wanted to talk to you about who we've brought in um, and also about the format that we have in store. And it's a real, it's a real treat. So the person that we brought in is Matt Tate. Um, and Matt Tate is um, famous, uh, in, in some circles we just talked about infamous, uh, but he, he's, he's an individual who has um, uh, been instrumental in uncovering election, election interference by foreign entities. Um, most notably in 2016 with respect to Russian interference in the United States election. Um, he, is well he was well positioned to do that. He was working as an independent um, consultant, but had had experience working for um, the British government. He was with um, UK's top digital intelligence agency. This is the uh, government communications headquarters, um, the GCHQ. Um, and so, uh, I won't steal his thunder, but let me just say that he was a very, and remains a very instrumental figure in this. Presently, he actually has joined us here in the United States, and he has um, uh, been at uh, UT Austin, where he serves as a senior cybersecurity fellow at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law, again at the University of Texas at Austin, um, one of our great sister uh, public research institutions, um, and a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, and there he does a very interesting thing, which is he teaches cybersecurity at a technical level to public affairs and law students, um, which I imagine is quite an interesting challenge um, and also quite a service. And the idea is very similar to what we think about at the Tech Policy Lab, which is creating a generation of policymakers and others, you know, industry um, leaders, uh, people in government, um, uh, lawyers and, 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 and technologists who are fluent um, or at least conversant um, in the technical as well as the policy and, and value uh, discussion. Um, so that's a project near and dear to our heart. Um, and so uh, he is someone that I, I could not recommend more that you follow on Twitter. He has an enormous um, Twitter following. And you can follow him at PWN, Pwn All The Things, which is very, very clever, but it's PWN ALL uh, The Things. Um, and and what, I, what I recommend for you, first of all, is that in addition to being really well informed and surprisingly accurate about the law, in fact, until I did some investigation, I thought he must have had a, a legal background, um, but also uh, funny and charming and all the other things. So I would, I would check that out if you don't already. So what's going to happen tonight is that um, Matt's going to talk to us about the issues that he's seeing out there now and, and, in, and in the future. Um, around interference with democratic processes. But then, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to announce that one of our colleagues in information um, science over at the Information School, uh, Megan Finn, is then going to have a conversation with Matt um, about the, this ecosystem. Um, Megan is an extraordinary um, a faculty member in her own right, um, and she studies not precisely election interference, but she studies uh, information infrastructures. And she's particularly well known for crisis informatics, that is, studying information flows in the wake of a disaster or a crisis. Truly fascinating work. Um, for Megan, I would recommend her um, book, Document Documenting Aftermath, Information Infrastructures in the Wake of Disasters, um, that, that is out with MIT Press. And you can find it on MIT, MIT Press's website, or you can find it on on Amazon. Um, and so they're going to have a, a discussion, uh, a, a dialogue, 
uh, about, um, about what we're seeing, seeing today. Um, we thought that that interactive format would be really enriching. Um, and then finally, we're going to, of course, open it up to your pressing questions, which I'm, I'm sure that you have. Um, so you'll see me twice more, once after, um, after Matt is done with his presentation, uh, giving us a lay of the land and his thoughts, um, and then to introduce uh, Megan and Matt, and then once again um, uh, at the closing of, of, of this discussion. So, so I just want to say you know, thank you to all of you for coming. Thanks very much uh, to Matt for coming all the way over from Texas, and to Megan for spending an evening with us. And thanks so much to Hannah, um, who is our program manager for the lab who once again, once again has put together just a truly amazing, amazing event. So with that, I'm going to welcome you up here, Matt, and uh, please join me in welcoming Matt Tate. Uh, wow, so uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Ryan and Megan and Hannah, for uh, putting this on. Thanks uh, uh, to the school as well for putting this on. Uh, when I was asked to you know, come and talk about hacking elections uh, and to sort of give an overview of this in 15 to 20 minutes. I thought, wow, that's, that's a broad topic to talk about, right? This is, you know, uh, hacking elections is something really enormous. Um, and why do you want me to talk about it of all of these people, right? You know, this is a very sort of uh, difficult topic to, to talk about. And, you know, we've just had an election here in the United States. Uh, you might be able to tell from my accent that I didn't get to participate in it. Uh, uh, which uh, was very sad to me, but uh, it was very exciting to watch, I guess, from a distance. Uh, so who am I? Um, my name's uh, Matt Tate. I currently, uh, Ryan's already sort of introduced me, uh, but I, I sort of uh, work in uh, UT Austin. Uh, but most of you probably know me as Pwn All The Things on Twitter, where I mostly waste time and pretend uh, uh, to do work. Um, but uh, before that, I used to work uh, doing lots of uh, quite technical things. Uh, I'm actually quite glad to be back here in uh, Seattle. When I first moved to the US, uh, I lived here for a brief while. And so it's uh, nice to be back here with uh, Seattle weather. Um, so I, I worked briefly with uh, Microsoft and with uh, Google doing very sort of technical things. Now I have the opportunity to do much less technical things with sort of policymakers. And uh, elections are one of these things where uh, sort of the interaction of cybersecurity and policy has become uh, sort of very foremost. Um, so anyway, one of the things that's very difficult for me when talking about elections, and election security in particular, first of all, I'm not a US citizen. And second of all, this is a really partisan topic. It's very difficult to talk about elections and election security without necessarily getting sucked into sort of the partisan divide in the United States. And coming as an intelligence professional, an ex-intelligence professional, it's really difficult to have this conversation without having all sorts of different uh, examples from Republicans versus Democrats. And this is a very difficult conversation to have, but I think it's very important to have it in a nonpartisan way. So I guess we can sort of start off by asking, what is election hacking? Why do we care about it? I appreciate the irony of a British person coming over to the United States and asking, what's the point of elections? What's the point of, uh, 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 wh wh why do we bother with this? It turns out that elections actually are very controversial. Um, they're actually extraordinarily expensive. Uh, so I have some figures here. Like uh, In the 2016 election, it cost about $4 billion just for the congressional races in political spending. It cost a further two and a half billion, with a B, dollars for the presidential part of the election, just in political spending. And just in terms of the time that everybody spent queuing up in order to put their you know, cross next to who they would particularly like to, to win this election, right? you know, nobody's doing this for fun. Uh, people are waiting in line for hours in order to do this. This is a lot of wasted time. This is a lot of uh, opportunity costs when these people could be doing work. There's a, Turns out that's about half a billion dollars worth of opportunity cost. And if we look at the infrastructure, like the infrastructure for elections is enormous, is vast. Just replacing all of the e-voting machines across the United States would cost about $3 billion. Right? This is about $10 billion of cost for doing elections. So why? Why do we do elections? What is the point of them? Nobody enjoys elections, right? 
This is not something that we're doing for fun. And I think one of the things that's sort of interesting is if we ask, well, what happens in countries that don't bother with democratic elections, right? Historically and currently around the world, there's lots of countries which didn't bother with elections, right? And it turns out that those countries do leadership changes too, right? But the way that they do leadership changes is quite different to the way that the United States does leadership changes. Right? At the end of our election, you know, in the United States here, uh, we choose someone different to be in charge, and that person is now in charge. And the previous guy gets to go on book tours, he gets to go and do whatever, and you know, he seems reasonably happy about that, right? Um, in other countries, when you want to become the next king, the way that you do it is you wait for the previous king to die, or surprisingly often, you try and speed that process up, <laughs> right? And it turns out that one of the things that happens is once you've taken control as the new king, one of the first things that you realize is that you're now the target of the next guy who wants to become king. And this means that consolidating power is no longer something that you might think of as being in the national interest. It's something that's now of extraordinary personal security interest to you. And what this means is it means that the next guy that comes in, the first thing that he's going to do is consolidate power and the way that they do that, increasing, well, sort of historically, has been to do this through quite bloodthirsty means, right? You know, if you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, for instance, you know, this is not a democratic country. As part of the transition of power there, uh, uh, the, the crown prince uh, sort of seized control. And what he did was he arranged for all of the people that might be a threat to his legitimacy, a threat to his uh, 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 power, he arranged for them to all be taken to the Ritz Hotel and persuaded that he was the legitimate ruler in ways that were pretty brutal, right? You know, not everybody survived that, right? It matters that we do elections versus other countries that don't do elections because power transfers happen anyway. And elections are one of the ways that we can, as a democratic country, avoid some of the bloodthirstiness of power transfers that happen in other systems. But what do we mean by hacking? Hacking is one of these very complicated words. I come from a technical background, and hacking to me normally means breaking into computers. But when we talk about election hacking, especially when we talk about the 2016 election, um, hacking tends to mean something quite broader. Lots of people talk about the 2016 election having been hacked. And what they don't mean, usually, is Russian government officials breaking into e-voting machines in order to change votes. Now, that's, of course, something that's uh, a very paramount concern. It's something that's uh, very important. We make sure that this doesn't happen. But e-vote hacking is a very small part of the overall picture. When we talk about election hacking, often we're talking about something that's much wider than that. There's lots of different aspects to it. One of the aspects that sort of matters for election hacking is, well, breaking into computer systems, breaking into John Podesta's email. Uh, most of you will, of course, remember in 2016, John Podesta's emails were stolen and then they were published. But does it matter that WikiLeaks was, say, publishing this? Uh, do we c contain sort of the, the disinformation aspects surrounding that as part of our definition of hacking? Do we include things like the Internet Research Agency and their troll farms as part of our definition of hacking? Uh, what about voter, disenfranchise voter disenfranchisement? Is that election hacking? What about gerrymandering? Is this election hacking? So one of the aspects that's very important is disinformation. Disinformation is probably the hardest aspect of election hacking to think about because it exists in a continuum where on one side of the continuum is clearly legitimate journalism, and on the other side of this continuum is clearly illegitimate election interference. And the real question is, how do we counter this? How do we think about it? How do we rationalize where on this line the bright line between legitimacy and illegitimacy lives? In the event that we're going to talk about, for instance, our political adverts, where do they live? on this line? When we start talking about partisan media coverage, where do they live on this line? 
one of the difficulties as we're currently seeing in the press is with the Mueller investigation is that certain aspects of the Trump campaign existed on the spectrum but further out towards the right. I think that that's something which has caused real concern in the United States. Where is the law on this? And the law is the point where the state is going to intervene. The state is going to say that beyond some particular line, it's illegitimate and the state is going to come in and say, you can't do this. But in the event that we draw that in the wrong place, actually we're censoring legitimate journalism. This is a real difficulty. Like, where do we draw these lines? So, what can we do about it? And does it matter who is doing it? For instance, the Internet Research Agency was the, you know, uh, the, the Russian uh, uh, citizens as non-state actors interfering in our election. But when alt-right trolls do it, are they interfering in the same way? Are we going to indict those two? When Russia Today, for instance, broadcasts extremely partisan press coverage, say that their coverage is illegitimate versus Fox News. Fox News also provides very partisan coverage, and it gets you know, considerably more att uh, attention from uh, US citizens. I think it really matters when we're looking at this to sort of break down the specific areas of election interference and to recognize that different parts of it have different responses. And the question is, well, who can do different things within this system? So to give you an example here, when the Russian government decides to interfere in the election, the federal government can come in and it can say, I'm going to push back against that. Because the federal government operates at this international sphere. And that means that they can do things like deterrence. Whereas when someone like Fox News publishes partisan media coverage, that's something that the federal government can't interfere in. Because suddenly this is domestic media. I think recognizing that there are different aspects to this and that there are different uh, groups in play really matters. So what can we do about it? That's a much harder question. That's a really difficult question. Well, different parts of it have different solutions. So we all know this guy. This guy is John Podesta. And we all remember him. Why do we know him? Why do we care who he is? Well, because he got sent this email. This is a very interesting email. And part of the thing that's really interesting about it is we have this email because WikiLeaks published it. This is the email that was sent to John Podesta that he clicked on and then gave his credentials to the Russian government. The reason we know that he was sent this email is because in a grand show of irony, this was one of the emails that they took and then they published it, right? So we actually know for sure that it was this email and we also are able to work out for sure that it's the Russian government because we can track these links and we can say, well, this particular link was sent by the same group that also were targeting NATO officials. They were targeting Ukrainian politicians. They were targeting uh, all sorts of other people. It's sort of very interesting that in their uh, attempt to publish all of his emails, they forgot to go back and correct the one email that revealed who they were. And this is what he saw. I challenge any of you to say that if you were sent that kind of email, that you wouldn't click through it, that you wouldn't enter your password on that page. We're sort of trained, I guess, in cybersecurity to look at phishing emails and to identify the ones which are most likely to trick us. This one would 100% trick me. Right? If you sent me this link with a URL that looked that legitimate, with my picture on it, with my name pre-populated, I would immediately, and without a second thought, enter my credentials into that box, right? And this is literally my job, right? 
And the reason that he got caught out was because your username and your email, your, your, your username and your password is sufficient to give the hackers access to your entire inbox. And it shouldn't be. This is very complicated, but in the event that we have technical solutions, and we do now have technical solutions to some aspects of it, then we can use these technical solutions to eliminate entire categories of the problem. This is a YubiKey or a security key that in the event that John Podesta had had on his machine, then when he was sent this email and he typed in his password, it would have said, okay, now it's time for you to tap your YubiKey. And because of the technology in this system, they wouldn't have been able to access his account. But it's sort of interesting that there are aspects of this security problem, of this election hacking problem, that we can fully defend against with technology. There are other parts that we can't defend so easily with technology. Vote counts, I think, are a really complicated issue. They're one of these areas where there are really good technical solutions to parts of this problem. But the real difficulty with e-vote counts in particular is the technology to defend them, although it works, is so complicated, ordinary voters can't understand it, right? That we have an entire field of cryptography which is designed specifically around solving this one problem. How can you have e-voting systems which are so secure that you can know for sure that hackers didn't break in? That's actually a stronger statement than saying that hackers didn't break in, but knowing for sure that hackers didn't break in. And it turns out that this is actually a more important problem to solve than keeping hackers out. Because actually, we always think of, when we think about e-voting machines, we think, how do we keep hackers out? It's more important to prove that we kept hackers out. Because the thing that you're trying to defend is not the e-vote count itself, but the legitimacy of the election. Because what happens when people stop trusting in the legitimacy of the election? Well, then you end up with all sorts of serious problems about uh, whether or not those people in charge actually have the legitimacy conferred on them through this election. And that's where things start to become dangerous. So we need to defend, and we can defend, with technology, we can defend e-voting systems. But we actually need to just do it. That at the moment, we don't do this. It's sort of thought of as sufficient when DHS says we don't have any evidence that people have tried to break into our e-voting systems. That's not sufficient, because for most people in this country, or for large amounts of people in this country, we look at this and we say, the fact that you haven't found hackers in our system, well, is that just because you haven't looked hard enough? Is that because this, uh, have you not found anything because you're not looking, or have you not found anything because there's nothing there? So we can defend some things, with technology. But we really can't defend everything with technology. And I think one of the things that we've learned from 2016 is that there hasn't been enough introspection from all sorts of parts of society which were really quite responsible for aspects of amplifying misinformation from the Russian government. When we look at, you know, this is from a Harvard study, when we look at the news coverage in 2016, we can see really clearly that some stories got a completely disproportionate amount of coverage. Whether or not you believe, for instance, Hillary Clinton's emails were a very important topic, I'm sure they don't deserve the sort of level of coverage that they got compared with, for instance, Trump's Russia connections. I think that it's very important to recognize that when Trump was getting coverage, he got primarily positive coverage for his policies and tended not to get very much coverage for his scandals, of which there were many. Whereas when you look with Hillary Clinton, she got enormous amounts of coverage for her scandals and very little coverage for her policies. I think it's important for news media to recognize that this is something that they need to look at when they're amplifying misinformation from uh, foreign hacked sources, what their role in this is. And to recognize that the federal government is not going to be able to solve this problem. And technology is not going to be able to solve this problem. And I think it's also incumbent on us all to think quite carefully 
about social media and our own influence on social media. Because this is, again, something that technology companies, something that uh, the federal government is not going to be able to solve for us. Why is it the case that we see so many clickbaity headlines? Why is it the case that we see so many uh, problems with social media? Well, fundamentally, the problem is adverts. Right? I hate to put all of this on one industry, but adverts is one of these areas that causes this enormous financial incentive for us to spend time in front of a computer screen on someone's website. And they've realized that they can get us to spend more screen time looking at clickbaity headlines. That they've realized that they can get us to uh, spend more time looking at things designed to cause outrage, things designed to keep us in uh, sort of a happy mood, to avoid cognitive dissonance. And this is how you get to financial incentives for echo chambers. And the financial incentives are not there for trustworthy reporting. The financial incentives are not there for true reporting. The financial incentives are there to show us things that we already agree with and things that spark our emotions and things that keep us clicking back, things which give us headlines that we agree with or could disagree with so that we share them more. Because adverts are driving the financial markets here. They're driving the financial incentives here. So I hope this has sort of framed some of the conversation that we're going to have to sort of discuss that there are, when we talk about hacking elections, this is actually a really broad area that we can sort of break down into certain categories. And that some parts of them, we actually do have really good answers to. When it comes to defending against phishing, when it comes to defending against certain categories of hacking, we actually have complete solutions. Right? When it comes to things like SQL injections of state and local infrastructure, we actually know how to defend those. We know how to eliminate SQL injections from code bases. We just should. When it comes to defending politicians from phishing, we can do that. And one of these security keys will cost $20, right? There's not that many politicians in the country. We can get one for all of them, right? You know, if it costs $10 billion to put on an election, how much does it cost to get everybody a $20 UB key, right, who's in the political sphere? We can completely defend some categories of this problem, and we should. But there are some parts that we can't defend with just technology. For instance, when it comes to defending uh, 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 against uh, Russian interference, that's something which only really the federal government can do. This is a question of deterrence, fundamentally. Right? This is something that we as citizens can't directly solve. This is an issue for deterrence. But I think it's also important fundamentally to realize that we can't fix everything with technology and we can't fix everything with government. And that some of these problems, we need to have a much bigger conversation within society because we're can't, there, there, there's no knights in shining armor out there who are coming to save us on things like media coverage, on things like social media. Right? We're not going to fix this with regulation. We're not going to fix this with technology. And fundamentally, those problems are the things that we need to spend more time looking at ourselves, looking at our influence on each other and the, the financial incentives that are driving this. Because if we're going to get stuck in echo chambers, then that's on us. So that sort of frames it in, I guess, 15 minutes. It's a very short time. Uh, but we have two years to get ready. And I think if there's one thing that anyone in, in the United States can agree on, right? the United States is built on elections. Right. This is a country more than any other that cares about democracy, that talks about democracy as one of its central founding principles. If there's one thing that everyone in the United States can agree on more than anything else, it's that of all of the eligible voters who want to cast their vote, they should be allowed to, and that their votes should be counted correctly. 
and that they should be informed when they go to cast their votes. We have two years until the next election. And I think we have time to get some of this ready. Thank you, Matt. That, that, was, that was absolutely terrific. Um, uh, somebody that, that Matt and I both know is a, a guy named Bobby Chesney, who's the director of the Strauss Center, where Matt works. And, he, and, and uh, Bobby was uh, uh, interviewed for a profile of Matt um, that was done by a journalist over the summer. Um, and he said, uh, Matt Tate has a unique ability to speak to all audiences very intelligently. Maybe it's his wonderful accent, maybe it's the personal charm, um, but maybe it's also his deep reflection on, on these, these values and these issues. So I really appreciate that very, very much. Um, so right now I'm gonna invite uh, Matt back up as long, uh, along with uh, Megan for the portion um, of this that is the structured dialogue. And so, um, Megan, could you please uh, come up here and, and Matt can invite you up here again. Um, and again, you know, Matt, uh, Megan, uh, for those of you who came in a little later, uh, Megan is a, a wonderful faculty member in our information school who studies um, information infrastructure. Um, and she has uh, agreed um, to our delight to, to interview Matt for this portion of the program. So um, Megan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and to Matt. And uh, thank you again for doing this, we appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, wow, quite loud. Um, <laughs> Hi, everybody. All right, well, thanks, Matt, for such a provocative talk um, that was very broad. I think you did a really great job of highlighting how complex all of these issues facing election security are and how many um, different institutions and sort of technical elements are brought together when we start to try to talk about what happened in 2016 and what we can do better in 2020. Um, I guess I wanted to start by just asking, um, what elections are you watching right now that um, you think might have interesting implications in the election security space? Well, I mean, the, the United States is in permanent election mode. So I think watching, watching the United States, and especially the 2018 election, I've sort of been calming down after like, the, the sheer level of excitement since the 2018 right. election sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, finally, finally now, weeks after the election is coming to a close, um, which is one of the sort of weird things about US elections. They never seem to quite end. Right. Um, but but uh, 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 at the moment, one of the things that I'm sort of watching is the UK, not so much about elections, but about uh, the referendum and sort of the, the closing of the, the Brexit uh, uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of instability at the moment uh, in the UK as a consequence of this. And it's something which is of uh, a very paramount concern to uh, uh, sort of the future of Europe uh, and the future of the UK. And uh, there's lots of external actors which are very interested in, in what that looks like, uh, either to end up with uh, softer or harder landings. And that's sort of been very interesting to, to watch. So what kind of election security or the sort of many, many topics that you highlighted in your talk are coming up as you're watching um, what Brexit is going to look like? Do you see that there's influence campaigns going on still, even though... So for, for sure, because one of the things that's uh, sort of uh, very controversial at the moment is uh, the extent to which this is uh, going to become a, a very hard Brexit with no deal versus whether it's going to be a soft deal versus whether uh, uh, plausibly there might be a, a second referendum or something much softer. And that, that of course, spans the, the entire range yeah. and is extraordinarily politically polarizing in the UK. Uh, and it's sort of fascinating to watch as uh, you know, especially online, there's been lots of people uh, who are taking sort of curiously uh, both positions and sort of dry, uh, recognizing uh, that, you know, you can have one set of Twitter bots sort of uh, arguing very strongly for, you know, a, a no deal Brexit. And you can have another set of uh, Twitter bots arguing very strongly that there should be uh, no deal and there should be a, a second referendum. And the purpose of this is to recognize this as a polarizing issue and it sort of drives a wedge in, in society. And that's actually very much the same sort of techniques that uh, 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 trolls have used in the United States as well, uh, both alt-right trolls and, and you know, uh, foreign government uh, trolls. This is uh, sort of identifying wedge points in society that they can take both sides on yeah. because it's the chaos that they want. It's sort of the, the driving the wedge that they want rather than necessarily a particular policy issue. 
Um, have any lessons been learned by what happened in the US in 2016? Um, so I, I think yes, but uh, as I sort of mentioned, this is such a broad area that you know lessons are often learned in quite narrow sort of specific segments. So in the UK, for instance, uh, they've spent a lot of time sort of talking about sort of uh, uh, defending politicians' accounts uh, to make sure that it's much harder for those accounts to be hacked. Okay. Uh, the, this is one of sort of the weird things between the UK and the US is that in the UK, when your intelligence agencies go to politicians and they say, "Hey, you can help secure your accounts," they're like, "Cool, this sounds like a great idea." Uh, and if you did that in the US, I think there would be a somewhat more freak out uh, if the FBI went to the, the Democrats and said, hey, we're the right guys to secure all of your emails. I'm sure right. we'd have different viewpoints, or even Republicans now. Uh, I think no, nobody in the US trusts the FBI anymore. But uh, uh, it, it, it's sort of fascinating to see sort of specific areas of it being uh, fixed. And we saw this with the French elections, for instance, the mm -hmm. election that uh, uh, led to the election of Macron, uh, they, they spent a lot of time thinking in advance, knowing in advance that uh, the Russian government in particular was going to be uh, uh, putting out a disinformation campaign and preparing for that in advance and that that sort of worked for them. I mean, when we look at other institutional configurations or ways of approaching the media and technology, are there, again, lessons to be learned from abroad for us here in the States? So there, there, there are, it depends. So part of the problem with the US uh, is that it's constitutionally very different to lots of the other countries that you can look at. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if I were to come up with a recommendation of, hey, you could have a single uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan election commission and they'll run all of your elections, this might be a great idea in the United States, but it's just never going to work, right? It's, it's going to run into constitutional problems, it's going to run into just sort of practical political problems. So there, there's some things that we can learn mm -hmm. abroad. Um, I think that, that the U.S. is such a unique system, and it's such a big system as well, it's difficult to transfer ideas wholesale from, say, Europe into the United States and say, they've got this solution that works much better. Like, you know, it would be much better if we had a parliamentary system, perhaps, in the United States. I don't <laughs> right, think this is right, going right. to happen anytime soon. Right. But I mean, even the way the French did prepare the media, at least, to consider um, some of the more extreme views as possibly not coming from the French themselves, it seems that that might offer a possible way forward? So, uh, not so much the French, but the Germans have certainly done this. So, uh, uh, we definitely saw this over the, the, the recent elections, that journalists were much more generally suspicious of leaked documents that had been given to them, because they knew, uh, not just from their history, but also from the 2016 election, that when you see hacked documents, you should be quite careful about taking them at face value. And this is one of the, the stories that I don't think people sort of fully remember from the 2016 election, but actually several of the documents that were given to the public as ostensibly hacked from the DNC were actually doctored. Uh, there, there, were, there were edits that were made to them for the purposes of influencing the public. Uh, and this is what, one of the reasons why my Twitter account has as many followers <laughs> as it does, was that when this first came out, one of the things that I was immediately looking for was uh, this felt like an old-fashioned Soviet disinformation campaign, and it seemed interesting to me, based on the history of Soviet disinformation campaigns, what they would often do is release a bunch of legitimate stolen documents, and inside there they would insert strategic fakes, because it's very difficult if you're confronted with a, a large body of evidence, most of which is true, 98% is true, and then there's 2% which is just something dreadfully scandalous dropped in a footnote or in an extra page, then of course you're sort of primed to believe it. Mm -hmm. And that happened in the 2016 election. It's just that it's not particularly public. So, for instance, uh, we know for sure that there was one of the documents that was released uh, containing ostensibly a national security strategy from the DNC. And we know that hackers in the, the Russian government went into that document and they added in the header of that document the word secret in capitals. And the purpose of that was they recognized that for Hillary Clinton, one of the really politically polarizing things was her use of uh, her personal email server and, and potentially whether or not there was classified information there. And so in the event that this was a hacked document that contained the word secret in the header and said it was a national security strategy, that would be very damaging to her. 
And it sort of didn't get very much attention because most people looked at it and they thought this is just secret in the sort of the colloquial sense yeah. rather than secret in the national security sense. So it didn't get much attention. But we know for sure that some of these strategic edits took place. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you became in the, uh, involved in the um, investigation of Russian interference in the 2016 election? Sure, so that is uh, a very surreal part of my life, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, uh, on June 14th, 2016, you ended up with uh, uh, the Washington Post released this blockbuster piece about how the, the DNC had been hacked. And this cybersecurity company called CrowdStrike had come in, they had looked at this uh, uh, server, and they had concluded that there was two different uh, uh, families of malware that had infected the server, uh, which they called Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear. And Fancy Bear was their internal name for FSB. Uh, uh, Cozy Bear was their internal name for SVR. And uh, it, it seemed to me, uh, when they first all sort of published this, it, it seemed a little bit difficult to believe that the Russian government would have hacked the same target twice from two different departments. That seems like a, a, a perhaps a communication error on their part. But also, there's good reasons if you're a cybersecurity company to perhaps you know, overblow how advanced the hackers are because that makes you sound better as a cybersecurity company. It makes your victim feel a little bit better that you know, they were hacked by super sophisticated people rather than super unsophisticated people. And also, it's, it, it didn't seem to me particularly controversial uh, that you know, foreign intelligence agencies are very interested in the political maneuverings of their major rivals. In the event that the Russian government was not trying to hack the DNC, frankly, they should get their tax rules back, right? Because that, that's, that's just intelligence 101. Um, and the, the thing for me which just was really weird was the next day what happened, which was that a WordPress account appeared called Guccifer 2.0, or Guccifer 2.0, depending on how you pronounce it. And they were trading off the back of the reputation of a previous hacker, Guccifer or Guccifer, uh, who was a Romanian hacker who had hacked Sidney Blumenthal. And this new hacker was claiming, I am the person that uh, hacked the DNC. Look, here's a whole bunch of internal documents that I've uh, taken. And this proves that CrowdStrike is wrong, right? That CrowdStrike said that this was the Russian government, but it's not the Russian government, it's me, some lone Romanian hacker. And to me, this was like an enormous red flag because there's loads of countries which would be interested in the political sort of system in the United States. Yeah. Uh, there's loads of countries which would be really interested in hacking those types of documents. And almost none of them would be brave enough to then turn that and pivot it into a disinformation campaign. And this was something that the Soviets used to do and not something that the Russian Federation had been doing very publicly, at least for uh, a long time. And that seemed to me to be really interesting. Um, and so the, the, my immediate thought was, if this is an old-style Soviet disinformation campaign, are they inserting fakes? Like, are the, what can we tell about these documents? Can we see where they've deleted a paragraph? Can we see where they've added a paragraph? And I started going through the metadata of these documents for that purpose. And then as I was going through that, uh, uh, I would sort of discover uh, other mistakes that they had made. So for instance, they had uh, used uh, Russian language settings on their computer as they had uh, uh, made these edits. Uh, or they, uh, the username on their computer was uh, a reference to the, the founding uh, member of the, the, the FSB. And, uh, uh, and, and it seemed to me like th 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 this is just an, an error on their part and just sort of calling it out, expecting that this sort of would all sort of wind down, they would go away, you know, run back to where they came from with their tail between their legs. And they didn't. They, they doubled down each time. And it was sort of fascinating, because what they would do is they would not only uh, uh, sort of go further and further in sort of their, their pretext that, the, you know, where... They is Guccifer too here? Yes, okay. as, as, as not, whoever... not being the Russian government. Right. But also they would go out of their way to discredit previous analysis. Okay. So having got caught out with Russian language settings on you know, their, their system, what they would do is they would start publishing more documents, but now they would start publishing them with intentionally different language settings or with different uh, uh, usernames. So you know, the, the next one would say Che Guevara as their username. Right? And what they were doing was they were clearly playing with the researchers, sort of watching what they were doing in real time, and then adding new bits of information to discredit the old ones. 
And that was sort of fascinating to watch. And it wasn't really until the WikiLeaks stump of the DNC documents, which led to the resignation of uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, sort of very publicly, that the entire operation sort of suddenly became very professional and started becoming much more clearly politically directed against the, the, the Democrats. And so I, I, at the time, I was just uh, one of the, the first people to sort of uh, start calling all of this out and sort of uh, going through these documents as I went and saying, this is, this is what I'm seeing versus, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're doing this and this is what I assess that they're, they're trying to do here. Yeah, it was pretty fun to sort of read through that 50 plus uh, Twitter chain to, to understand your thinking. Um, you know, one question that came up, so I got to ask a bunch of students and colleagues uh, what they wanted to know from you. And a lot of people were like, how did he learn how to do this stuff? And sort of what are the techniques, some of the techniques that you were using, like looking at macros in Word mm -hmm. seem rather um, pedestrian maybe, even for average users, like we could figure out how to do that and then other ones, uh, much more exotic. Um, so how, how did you learn how to do this really cool stuff? <laughs> well, I mean, so uh, uh, my, my, my focus has always been on looking at primary documents. Mm -hmm. uh, wh whenever I see news stories, my sort of instinct is to say, I don't necessarily trust the analysis by the journalist. I want to go to the primary documents and then see what's going on for myself. Mm -hmm. So I want to sort of get into the mind of the people writing these documents. And so a lot of that has sort of led me to, when I see documents, to look for uh, bits and pieces of hidden data. Okay. You know, uh, not just what this person is writing, but how they're writing, the style that they're doing. Uh, you know, and then also, when did they write it? What computer did they write it on? Uh, and looking for forgeries in particular, you know, looking for tiny mistakes that they've made and seeing whether or not you can learn something about this document that nobody else is going to learn from it. And because that will give you some insight into who these people are, how they're thinking, and that will give you a, a little bit of a, a, an edge when you're trying to predict what they're going to do next. And so a lot of sort of uh, uh, looking at metadata, looking at, you know, these timestamps, all that kind of thing, sort of evolved from that, you know, uh, uh, going to the original documents and trying to find bits of hidden information that nobody else is really looking for. Yeah, and it's super interesting that you've been publishing a lot of your findings on Twitter. And so I'm curious sort of how, how using Twitter fits into your public scholarship and your thinking about doing this analysis. Well, Twitter's a really strange place. So I, I sort of set up my Twitter account really never expecting it would look anything like this. That, this is why it has a, a, a cartoon meme and a, a silly <laughs> name. Is I never expected it to be sort of attached to me personally. Um, <laughs> and, uh, 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 you know, it's sort of, it's sort of uh, taken off on a, a life of its own. And, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, it has its upsides and its downsides, I guess. But um, uh, one of the things that I always used it for was trying to look for in documents, sort of go back to the primary sources and trying to extract as much information as I can. And one of the things that I've always been very wary of is it's easy to read documents in ways that mean that you're looking into them for what you want to find mm -hmm. rather than what's in there. Mm -hmm. And so what I would intentionally do was I would create long Twitter threads of everything that I could find and I would take this sort of uh, mental effort of I will start at the beginning and I will not stop till I hit the end, right? I will read the whole document from start to finish rather than going through, you know, uh, a control effing for the words that I would like to, to have for some, you know, mm. cool news story. Because I'm not constrained in the same way that most journalists are, which is that they have to get a story out quickly. I have the opportunity of time that I can just go through and I can find everything. I can look at the little stories which are not good enough for a, a journalist to sort of publish. And so that's what I was using Twitter for, was you know, just to sort of call out the things that I thought were interesting, see what other people uh, had as theories as to what, what was going on in something versus something else, to sort of draw attention to it. Uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, just because if you're doing it publicly, it actually incentivizes you to do all of it. <laughs> Whereas in the event that you're okay. doing it not publicly, then it's very easy to say, you know, I'm bored, I've done two hours of reading this document, I think I understand where the document is going, I'll stop now. Whereas in the event that it's like, you know, a thousand page document, it's going to take you 24 hours to read it. Yeah. Right? That's a lot of work. 
And if you're doing it publicly, it, it sort of forces you into the habit of doing it a little bit more carefully. And then once you've done it, it's also a reference for you to go back to. Um, I often use my, my Twitter account for that purpose. That you know, I remember I read this document. It had something interesting or important to say. What did it say? I'll go back. I'll search my own Twitter account, and that will you know, take me back to the point where I found it. And then I'll know what the source was. I'll know the, the, where it was. OK. Do you, I mean, do you worry at all that you're saying things that would in some ways like compromise American security or, um, I, you know, your analysis is catching things that CrowdStrike is not catching and that... So, so there, there have been times before when there, there's, especially when it comes to uh, FOIA requests, there's been a lot of times where people have misredacted things. Mm. Okay. And in some cases, I will call that out for the purposes of making the point that it's been misredacted, because I think it's important when uh, things actually have you know, real-world consequences, it's important that they get redactions correct. But there, there have been some times where I've found things uh, like names of particular staff, uh, uh, sort of identifying uh, specific things which would cause quite sort of exquisite harm to specific individuals. I'm not going to call that out on Twitter because I, I don't think that would be appropriate. Right, right. And for you, so this reading for you is obviously multi-layered. I'm wondering, a lot of us have been wondering a lot about what, how's artificial intelligence going to affect the election interference picture and how are you thinking about this sort of multi-layered re reading and the potential for um, editing, if you will, like videos and images and all of these other um, interesting ways of manipulating public opinion um, with AI and all of these other advances coming at us. So I, I think one of the real dangers with AI is the extent to which it's going to enable forgeries that are going to be really compelling forgeries. And we can already sort of, like, if, if you want to know how good AI is, like, look at the predictive text on your phone or the predictive text in your Gmail. Like, how good it is at, like, constructing completely legitimate sentences that you might plausibly otherwise type by learning from what it is that you normally type. And it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, only a matter of time until someone can say, I have, you know, all of these hacked emails from you. I can create new complete forgeries which have your style. Right, that they're not yeah. just, you know, they're saying something that you didn't say, they're saying something you didn't say in your style in a way that any of your friends would recognize immediately as your style, because the AI has learned it. Uh, and it's not just going to do this for text, it's going to do this for pictures, right? I mean, uh, we're here at UW, so uh, uh, there's uh, lots of uh, research here on uh, yes. editing, uh, editing uh, videos yeah. in ways that are extremely plausible. Yeah. And I think that's going to be really dangerous. Uh, you know, we, we already have... Uh, politicians who are willing to, you know, uh, uh, post things which are uh, uh, edited and sort of in, in nice meme format. Uh, what happens when they start uh, getting sent memes which are actually completely, f you know, fabricated videos? Yeah. You know, what happens when it's uh, 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 former President Obama saying something that he never actually said that's getting retweeted by the president? Like, what happens then? You know, how many people are going to believe this, and how many people are going to say? Uh, you know what, I'm going to wait to you know, find the ground truth on this before I sort of assume that this is what actually happened. Yeah, uh, <laughs> frightening. So you touched a little bit on um, bots in the UK debates that are going on. Can you talk about what the role of bots is in shaping the electorate and public dialogue? Because I think not all of us are as well versed um, in some of the stuff that you referenced. Right, so I mean, that's a, a very sort of broad, complicated question. Um, but so one of the things that bots primarily are used for at the moment is sort of amplifying specific topics. Okay. So often there'll be a topic which actually doesn't, under normal circumstances, would not get a lot of attention because they're, they're kind of niche or they're, they're viewpoints that actually very few people actually hold. Like they might be extremely offensive views, but they're views that not very many people actually hold. And um, with the use of bots, what they're able to do is they're able to massively amplify those voices and make it sound like those, those views actually are held by a, a much larger percentage of the population than actually they really are. And a consequence of this is that they can then cause a much greater deal of panic amongst the rest of the public who then think, 
oh, this viewpoint that previously I assumed, you know, there was a, a couple of hundred people across the United States held this view. Actually, maybe a couple of hundred thousand people across the United States hold this view. And that can sort of lead to massive divisions internally. Uh, and we certainly see this with uh, a sort of a, a sort of massive amplification of uh, alt-right messages. Um, and we've, we've seen this in the UK, for instance, where uh, sort of uh, neo-Nazis in the UK have sort of uh, said, we're going to hold this uh, rally, and this gets massively amplified, and everyone thinks, oh my goodness, there's going to be this massive rally of neo-Nazis, and the police have to come out in a massive show of force in order to like, try and uh, uh, sort of have a, a, a clear divide between the, sort of the neo-Nazis on one side and the anti-fascists on the other. And then only six people actually turn up, because in reality, it's six people plus 100,000 bots who are amplifying their message. And I think that it can, especially in social media, we can get very distorted views as to what actually people really do think because of the amplification, the sort of the misamplification of certain voices through these bots. And I think that's, that's something that's quite difficult. Are there technical approaches to dealing with some of the issues around bots? So it's, it's very difficult because inherently, you, the way that you are interacting with the internet is through your computer. So anything that you can do with the internet through your computer, AI can also do through the internet through your computer in a way that's indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's some ways that we can make it more clear to people that certain things are using, for instance, uh, when you're posting through the Twitter website, you're, like, that, that's how humans interact with Twitter, whereas with lots of these bots, they're interacting with Twitter through some of these programmable interfaces. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's a lot of scope for Twitter saying, you know what, the accounts that are uh, interacting through the programmable interface are going to highlight in some slightly different way. And of course, that's not going to prevent uh, very advanced uh, people you know, designing these bots to interact with you know, uh, Twitter through the website. But it makes it harder for them, and it makes it more likely that these people, or these, these accounts which are pretending to be real users, but actually are just one of a swarm of uh, programmed interfaces uh, and programmed bots, I think, those are highlighting that some of the people that you're interacting with on Twitter are not real people. That's something that they can do. And they can sort of catch sort of 98% of them on the first cut. And then you can do something else in order to try and catch you know, the 98% of what's left and so on and so forth. And eventually you get to a point where only very, very advanced people are able to genuinely masquerade computers as humans. I, I think that's something that social media companies haven't spent much time doing and something that they could. That's an exciting idea. Um, so what kind of frameworks do you think would support um, a stronger voting infrastructure from a policy standpoint, if, if any? So one of the real difficulties with voting infrastructure in the US is uh, first of all, that it's, it's massively like, outsourced to the individual states mm -hmm. who have their own reasons for you know, either having good systems or bad systems. And sometimes having bad systems is a feature, not a bug for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really problematic. Right? You know, uh, uh, when you turn up to a voting precinct and there's you know, four hour lines, right? when you sort of first look at that, you think, my goodness, how, how, how did we screw up so badly that this happened? And after a while, you think, oh, this wasn't actually an accident. Mm -hmm. and I think that it's, it, it is deeply un-American that you know, some people are trying to disenfranchise uh, other citizens from the vote. And I think that it's, it's worth recognizing that some of the problems that we have are intentional mm -hmm. rather than sort of because we haven't got enough money or because we haven't put enough time and work into fixing it. And I, I think that that's something which we as society need to get better at calling out mm -hmm. and clamping down on. But it's very difficult at the federal level to sort of force that down because this is sort of an inherently states uh, uh, issue. And it, it's fiercely contested. If you ever speak with election officials in any of the, the states, one of the things that you discover very quickly is their antipathy often towards the, the federal government. They yeah. don't want the federal government coming in and telling them how to run their systems. And you know, that can cause enormous amounts of friction in very complicated ways. One thing that I do think we can do, uh, which we have done, is uh, designating things like election systems as critical national infrastructure, which gives the federal government more opportunity to defend election systems at the federal level. So the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security have more opportunity 
to defend these systems because we have designated them as critical national infrastructure. One of the other things I think we can do that we're not very good at doing is making funds available to the states for things like cybersecurity. To say, you know, uh, uh, it, it is, if we want cybersecurity for e-voting machines, for instance, there's actually a really big difference between the federal government saying, we will test your infrastructure up to the value of $2 million versus here is $2 million for you to test your election infrastructure. That, you know, one of these is going to get an enormous amount of pushback and the other one is going to be you know, uh, uh, invited with open arms because uh, it's, it's money for, mm -hmm. for, for them to spend as they want. And I think having a better understanding that sometimes actually everyone wants the same outcome, but how you get to that outcome can actually really matter. I think that, that's something that we're not very good at in society. Super interesting. Um, so how do you see these election issues that we've been talking about connecting to broader um, cyber insecurity trends generally? Uh, so how, how do you mean? Like, Well, I mean, I guess, so we talked about um, interference in the US elections along the lines of misinformation or these sort of very specific hacks that the Russians um, seek to sow divisions or um, sow confusion and chaos um, to even um, fabricate you know, activist groups. Um, do you see this having sort of more broad effects beyond the election? Um, certainly you talked about the referendum in the UK and just sort of influence within the general conversation there. But I mean, elections are sort of these very specific decision points. So sure, so uh, the, purpose, the point of these types of misinformation campaigns is in order to affect uh, uh, sort of uh, the citizenry, in order to sort of affect how people view specific issues. And elections are one sort of very obvious example where affecting people's viewpoints is going to affect a real world outcome, i.e. the election. But also referendums are another good example, but also just general policy issues. So uh, another good example is the Mueller investigation. Right? The Mueller investigation is enormously polarizing in the United States. Right? There's a, a, a lot of people who you know, deeply believe that this is going to fix the, the United States. There's a lot of people who deeply believe that it is uh, uh, antithetical to, to the US system and would like it to be disbanded. And this is an enormous friction point within the United States as a policy issue. And that it sort of touches on uh, uh, foreign governments as well in this case. And it's something that is very easy for these bots, for the, you know, uh, foreign governments to want to affect on this specific issue. Uh, so it's not just elections, but it's sort of uh, issues when they sort of get to the national level and they become enormous friction points become something which is of real interest to them. Uh, it, it's, it's less the case once you start to get down towards sort of state referenda. Uh, but we've definitely seen inter interference with uh, California, for instance, with uh, uh, trying to boost the sort of the California secession movement. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been sort of a, a large amounts of work put in to try and make that movement sound bigger than it is and to sort of fund it and make it uh, a, a feel bigger. Uh, but sort of at the national level, I think that's still where a lot of these sort of concerns are, are getting driven. Great. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you've given a couple of really interesting talks about um, the history of disinformation during the Cold War. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about what you've learned by looking at that history yourself and um, what we can sort of take away from thinking about that. Sure. So, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating area of history, actually. But uh, uh, the two big things is sort of to recognize, first of all, that this is part of a, a sort of a, a, a grand strategy of, you know, th th there is very serious amounts of money put into this. There, there were, uh, uh, during sort of the Soviet era, uh, the, 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 the Soviet government was putting in roughly the same amount of money into disinformation targeted at the US mm -hmm. that the US was putting into the National Security Agency total. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, wow. this is yeah. vast, vast amounts of, of cash. And what they did was that they didn't just say, you know, I'm going to do this one thing. And then six months later, that didn't work. They'll just do this one other thing, right? They, they were just doing large numbers of these all of the time. And some of them would work and some of them wouldn't work. And the ones which would work, they would then drive further. And the ones which they wouldn't work, they would throw them away and they would you know, try other ideas. 
And what they would do is they would look for you know, compliant journalists who were not going to check their sources particularly carefully, who often had an you know, ideological bent to start off with. And they would feed them sort of uh, either uh, uh, real things, but with you know, sort of a, a massive partisan spin that could be put on it, or real things combined with forgeries that could be used in order to sort of drive public opinion. And there's uh, lots of examples of that in uh, sort of the, the history of uh, okay. yeah <laughs> yeah where, where, where you know where, uh, things like uh, suggesting that AIDS was uh, caused by uh, the U.S. government uh, was specifically a campaign in order to influence uh, Africa and to, to sort of uh, uh, drive them and regimes in Africa towards the Soviet Union away from the, the United States. And you know things like uh, inserting uh, uh, the forgery of the, the U.S. Uh, field army manual to say that uh, uh, the U.S. was torturing people in Vietnam. The, 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 pur the purpose of this was in order to drive public opinion both in the United States but also outside of the United States to be more hostile to the United States and therefore by, uh, uh, by, by extension closer to the Soviet Union. And they just see this as part of their general foreign policy. This is, you know, uh, uh, you, you have your sort of overt foreign policy done through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but you have this much wider gray space, which is just part of your, your, your standard operating procedures in order to drive people closer to your alignment and away from the U.S. And so much of that sounds so familiar today, and it just raises the question for me of, like, you know, from, say, you know, early 90s through 2014, were we just all asleep at the wheel or were these sort of covert operations still being planned and planted, you know, these sort of seeds of misinformation being planted in our public sphere or um, was well, there like a dormant period? <laughs> so the, the, both, I think. So I, I think the, the, the sort of post-Cold War, the, the, the it sort of dropped off dramatically. Um, but it, it, there, there's always been a sort of an undercurrent there, and it sort of ramped back up very massively in 2016. It was, you know, uh, uh, quantitatively quite different in 2016 compared with other uh, previous elections. But it's, it's sort of important to recognize that, that these things have always been there, and part of the reason it was as big as it was because they really didn't get that much pushback on it. Okay. And I think the U.S., has forgotten a lot of the lessons that it learned about deterrence from the Cold War, yeah. uh, especially with the, the previous administration. Um, and it sort of led often to very high volume rhetoric that got, I think, heard in Moscow quite differently to how the US intended it to be heard. Mm. So for instance, when you phone up uh, 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 your counterpart in FSB and you say, uh, uh, I, I see what you're doing, they say, so? Like, we don't care. Like, what are you going to do about mm -hmm. it? Like, you know, cool, you, you, you can tell that we're, we're doing this, but we're not getting any pushback. And what happened was when they, they, they were quite sort of careful and quite strategic as to pushing back against U.S. provocation or what they perceived as U.S. provocations. So uh, we often forget uh, in sort of towards the end of summer 2016, there was a series of leaks in uh, uh, U.S. Uh, newspapers through the Washington Post and the New York Times that the U.S. was planning a retaliatory strike against the, the Russian government in the case that they were going to do uh, interference, and that this sounded like uh, you know potentially they had access to the, the Russian grid, that they would be able to do uh, lights out for, for the Russian government. And then in the middle of this, there was this massive leak of uh, this new group called Shadow Brokers, which released a bunch of... Uh, NSA or allegedly NSA tools. Um, and part of the purpose of this was to say, we see you too, right? You know, we have leverage too. And that sort of caused, you know, internal chaos inside the, the United States and it's had some uh, very significant knock-on effects with mm -hmm. things like the WannaCry ransomware as the, sort of the consequence of this. But also, it, it, sort of the, the, this sort of like covert trying to do this sort of covert signaling, I think, also has been very dangerous. Uh, that we've sort of forgotten that deterrence requires overt signaling. Mm -hmm. right? you know, uh, we have the Open Skies uh, uh, Treaty in the United States so that the, the Russian government can fly over our nukes and see that they're there. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, it, we're not hiding them. Right? We want them to see how many we have. We want them to understand what it is that we have so that they can plan for it, so that everybody understands where, the, you know, where everything is. When we expel X many diplomats, they're going to expel X many diplomats. Everyone understands this because it's overt signaling. 
And the covert signaling that went on in 2016, I think, was extremely dangerous. And a good example of this was at the very end of uh, uh, sort of the, the summer campaign, um, there was the, the Murray botnet. Uh, it was a, a, a cybercrime group which had hacked loads of Internet of Things cameras. Uh, it took out the DNS service, which is a core internet infrastructure for, uh, 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 for the East Coast. And this took down uh, Amazon AWS, took down Netflix, took down a bunch of uh, uh, sort of core infrastructure on the East Coast. And this was all happening in a world where, you know, the Washington Post was talking about uh, the NSA making Moscow go dark, where shadow brokers had suddenly leaked a bunch of allegedly NSA tools, where you have uh, everybody talking about the Russian government hacking the US and maybe the US doing some kind of response, and the East Coast goes dark. Mm -hmm. Suddenly everyone's panicking and thinking this sounds like, you know, a, a cyber attack by the Russian government. And it turns out it wasn't. It was just this criminal group. And when you're doing all of this covert signaling, you really run the risk of massive escalations that you didn't expect. And I think the, the previous administration was not good at understanding how to do overt signaling. And you know, as a final example of this, uh, the sanctions that they did right at the very end of the previous administration in December 2016 were really muddied. Uh, where they basically said, we are sanctioning all of these large collection of groups for all of this collection of facts. Right, right. And they weren't good at saying, we're doing this bit for this reason, and this bit for this reason, and this bit for this reason. Which means that when they did that, it wasn't particularly clear which parts are you trying to signal are things that we can't do. What are real red lines? What are just you're being angry at us? Hmm. And of course, that was made much more complicated by uh, the incoming administrations sort of messing with that. But it, it, Understanding deterrence is something which I think the previous administration and certainly the current administration haven't done particularly well. Um, I'm going to invite people up to the microphones. I think there's one at that, one at that corner and one over here um, to ask questions. Am I right? Oh, yeah, one at the far ends of the room um, to ask questions. Um, and I guess, so what would good deterrence look like right now while people are queuing up? So I, I think it's... We, 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 with the current president's current approach to Russia, I think that it's very difficult to see how you can have any kind of plausible deterrence. Okay. Um, but uh, in, in the event that the president said, for instance, uh, you know what, the, the Russian government did hack uh, uh, the DNC, and that, that's an outrageous infringement on the political process inside the United States, and we're going to uh, uh, sanction that, and we're going to uh, uh, put in serious resources into defending it. And in the event that this happens in 2020, then, uh, you know, here's these sequence of events which the Russian government is going to really dislike. So, uh, lethal aid to Ukraine, for instance, or, you know, ramping up U.S. efforts in Syria. Those would be of extraordinary foreign policy consequence to the Russian government. They would then see that as a, a, a legitimate threat. But I think part of the difficulty is that you can't really do retrospective deterrence this mm -hmm. far after the fact. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I don't think there's anything the US government can do to deter 2016. But what you can do is you can say, going forward, these are our red lines and this is what we're going to do. But the important thing is that they need to be credible. And at the moment, it's very difficult with the current administration to see how they're going to come up with a threat that's going to be credible. Yes. Um, all right. So we've got some folks who have questions. I just ask that people ask their questions briefly so we have lots of time to hear answers. I'll start on this side with Dharma. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk and the conversation. Um, I've been listening and thinking about uh, Robert McChesney's book, Telecommunications, Mass Media and Democracy, which is about the 1920s and the setup of the broadcast system in the US and how it very intentionally was designed to keep out, keep Russians from being able to um, be able to have access to the, the US. And, and it did so from a structural perspective of how the broadcast system was designed. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've, if you've thought about that comparison and now that everything is connected to everything, I think we're not really prepared for that, but I don't know what, what that brings to mind for you too. Thank you. Right, so I mean, that, that, that is a, that's a really good question. It's, it's very, the internet makes a lot of these problems much more difficult because of the global nature of the internet. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, as we've seen with uh, the 2016 uh, events, a lot of these events were actually being done from inside Russia. So th these are things that we can't sort of uh, uh, kick people out as a consequence of. We can't you know, send uh, the FBI around to their house to arrest them in ways that would have been much more plausible uh, back in, say, the, the 1920s. Um, we, we do have real problems, I think, trying to get a handle on the fact that information is now an extremely global affair, that actually the news sources that we have are often you know, very international, and the people that we're interacting with on social media in particular are very international. And we can't have a system where we just say, you know, here's a US Twitter that, you know, everybody uses. Because US tech companies, they have no interest in, you know, uh, uh, carving up their, their platforms for specific geographic areas. So I think unless we get to something like that, and I don't think there's any sort of uh, reason to believe that that's going to happen, um, we just have to cope with the fact that our information sources aren't going to be controlled and perhaps shouldn't be controlled. Uh, we just have to learn how to cope with that. There's one on the side. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk and the conversation. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you have any insight into uh, the Estonian online voting system, uh, which is a country that obviously has went 100% uh, online voting, and um, how that's playing out in the current context, and if there's been any adversarial pressure on uh, their system. Right, so the es Estonian system is actually really interesting. Uh, and part of the reason it's so interesting is because they're, 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 of course, right next to Russia, they, they've had real problems uh, with the, the Russian government interfering in their processes for, you know, uh, forever. And one of the ways that they, they solve this is they say, we're going to have online voting, but it's not just ordinary online voting. It's not online voting where you just log into a website and provide your credentials and uh, 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 then you're in. You have everybody in Estonia has their EID cards. Uh, which contain on them uh, a, a private key which allows you to sign an action as a private citizen. Uh, so when you vote, uh, you're voting through your computer, you're not just uh, typing in like, a username and password which can be you know, easily uh, stolen or can be hacked or can be forged by the Russian government, you're actually digitally signing it with an EID card, which means that in the event that someone did hack one of these uh, voter tally systems, you'd be able to see immediately these digital signatures have, uh, uh, are wrong. In the event they tried to do uh, uh, ballot stuffing, you'd realize immediately that actually lots of these uh, uh, ballots are forged because of the cryptography, because of the, the digital systems that are involved. Uh, I do think that Estonia is a really good example of where technology is seen as a, a, a sort of a, a first party part of the solution. Like you can't solve everything with technology, but there's a bunch of things that we really can solve with technology. And I think it's very easy to get sucked into nihilism in this country with you know, how bad some of the systems are. You know, uh, uh, most people, when you talk about uh, e-voting systems, they say, no, these are terrible, we have to go to paper, but then paper is also pretty terrible for all sorts of other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, we can have secure systems, and Estonia is a, a fantastic example where, where that works. Um, and we can and should learn from them, bluntly. Let's go back to the side. Hi. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe CAPTCHAs are a technology that ascertains that a user of a system is a real human as opposed to a bot. So why doesn't Twitter and Facebook implement them for like each post to ascertain that it's not a bot? Uh, so that, that, that's a great question. Um, the answer is because the more you ask people to demonstrate that they're a human before every time that they do it, the, if, before every time that they post, the more you're going to annoy them, right? And part of the, the sort of financial incentives of social media companies is not to make sure that there are no bots on their system, but to make sure that you're spending as much time on their system as possible so that you get to see as many ads as possible because that's how they make money. And in the event that you had a Facebook or you had a Twitter where every time you had to have a post, you had to complete one of these annoying capture things, what would happen very quickly is that there would be a common rival service where you didn't have to do that. And people would quickly drain towards it. Because if your Twitter, if your Facebook, what you want is you want people producing good, quant good content for your system. So not only do those people spend lots of time watching adverts, but other people come to their platform to look at those people generating content to see those adverts. And 
the more you require them to do, do sort of complicated proofs, I mean, you've all done captures, they're annoying, right? They're, and increasingly, they're difficult for us humans to even do, right? You know, uh, 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 quite often I get, you know, shown a, a picture of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, street, a street, and they say, click on all of the signs. And I click on all the signs, and then it says, you still haven't clicked on one, because there's one hidden behind a tree, right? <laughs> and, you know, uh, at, at some point, I feel like it's a personal attack that I'm not a real human. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, one of the other problems, of course, with AI is that AI is getting more and more advanced. The reason these captures are becoming more and more annoying is because AI is getting better and better at fooling these systems into saying that they are human. And so what's going to happen is over time, we're going to end up with these systems where it becomes almost impossible to get a system where a human is able to demonstrate that they're human and an AI isn't. But even if you could, you're annoying your human visitors if you're asking them constantly. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so there were some media reports that you were interviewed by the special counsel's office related to the whole Peter Smith affair. Um, what was that like? Are there any fun anecdotes you can share? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I have learned today from Jerome Corsi what, what it's like to, to go on record with all sorts of things that you shouldn't probably go on record with. So I'm, I'm, I, I, the question is well met. I, I'm going to decline to, to answer, but uh, it's, We're it's, the it's, 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 it's a great question. Thanks. Okay. Hi there. Um, really enjoyed uh, your talk. I'm, I know that you were very, from the start, and kind of went out of your way to be very diplomatic about the partisan nature of this kind of interference. But it is inherently partisan, and there's a very clear trend, both in the US and the UK, that there is a clear beneficiary of this activity and a kind of a clear opponent of it. How do we approach any of these solutions where the half the country and the, ma uh, half, you know, the major political party doesn't seem to be in any way motivated to give a shit? Like, because they're benefiting from it. And one day they might not be, because as you say, they're just trying to sow chaos. But like right now, like, how, what are the levers of power that we can actually exert any influence? Because the problem is in voting systems in Washington state where, you know, we're all, you know, crazy hippies. It's the problem is the voting systems in, you know, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, which don't exactly have motivated parties. Right, that, that's, it's a really difficult question. It's a really difficult problem. Because fundamentally, the, 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 the good solution to, if this was any other system, the solution would be you elect them out and you get different people. But this becomes self-referential because to vote them out requires you to use the election system that you have. And I think, you know, uh, uh, elections in this country have never been good, right? Bluntly, they've never been good and they were designed from the ground up to not be particularly fair. Um, and over time, they have got better. Uh, and partly that's through constitutional amendments. A lot of the constitutional amendments in the US are specifically extending the franchise to people that were previously disenfranchised. And part of the reason for this is that, you know, th th this happens uh, as an evolution over time. And I think that this might be the way that uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, get solved is uh, uh, through constitutional amendments. But, uh, Ultimately, no matter how much these systems are unfair, you can overcome the unfairness in it in the event that it becomes so drastic that you end up with a, a complete tidal wave that overthrows it. And then those people can actually reform the system to make it more central. And then that tends to sort of uh, uh, entrench it. But it is a very difficult problem because the, the election system is in probably the most difficult system of all systems to fix because it's inherently political. The people that are in charge by definition have benefited from it and therefore also by definition the least incentivized to fix it. When elections go wrong, what you're really doing is you're saying that the election was illegitimate. And the people in power, the one thing that they can all agree on is that them being elected is 100% legitimate. It's the most legitimate that it has ever been. And so it's, it's it's a really difficult question, and also when you want the state to intervene in order to make things better, you have to recognize that the state that will be doing the intervening 
is the current state, which is the state that you think has problems, right? So in the event that you wanted, you know, uh, 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 we're here in Seattle, so most people here uh, are, I'm sure are Democrats. Like in the event that you think the federal government should come in and fix a lot of these state systems, do you really want Donald Trump coming in and saying, I'm going to fix the, the problems in Washington state, which might be problems that he's invented, they might be problems which, you know, are going to try and uh, skew the vote in a, a different direction. I, I think that it's, it's the most difficult system to fix, and ultimately it only is fixed at the ballot box. All right, well, I just, I just want to say this has been an absolutely um, fascinating conversation. We could continue all night, but we are out of time, so please join me in thanking both uh, Megan and Matt for coming all this time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>